Hello everyone, welcome back. If you've been here the entire morning, congratulations. Wow, what an effort, especially on day two of an event. And whether you were at Platea yesterday or whether you were at the awards yesterday, and if you've got a hangover, if you're absolutely fine, watching seven out of seven deserves a medal. I think that's a brilliant effort. So thank you again for your attendance and attention. We're going to pass on to now our last roundtable of this morning. Plenty more to come this afternoon, of course. Uh, this one is about women empowerment in football. En español, el empoderamiento de la mujer a través del fútbol. Y sabemos qué tan poderoso es el fútbol para involucrar a los hinchas y también para efectuar cambios sociales de tipos diferentes. Pero cómo se podría aprovechar para fortalecer a las mujeres. Uh, we all know how powerful football can be as a vehicle uh, to engage fans, but also to affect positive social change. And it can be done in many different respects, but how can it be harnessed to empower women? Uh, we will discuss this theme further with our next few guests. Es el tema que vamos a abordar con las siguientes invitadas. Uh, please welcome to the stage, first of all, our moderator, uh, Rebecca Smith, ex-captain of the New Zealand women's team, Fatuma Adda, founder and executive director of Holly, and also giving us a speech and a presentation before she takes part in the discussion, the ex-captain of the Afghanistan women's national team and founder and director of the girl power organization, Khalido Popal. Please welcome them onto the stage. How are you doing, Rebecca? The girls are milking the entrance, aren't they? Thank you very much. Hello. Great to see you, Fatuma. And last but by no means least, Galida. Lovely to meet you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me here. And thanks a lot for World Football Summit for giving me the opportunity to share my journey and experience with you in a football world that I have been to. I am former captain of Afghanistan women's national team and founder of Afghanistan women's uh, football. I started my journey from my family. This is the picture of my family. I grew up in a very beautiful, unique family in Afghanistan where it calls a male-dominated country. I played football with my brothers. Playing football with my brothers, it always taught me to be united, to, to be together, to love each other, and to empower each other. I never felt inequality while I was playing with my brothers. The time that the ball was rolling, I felt that all together we are equal. I never felt inequality in my family. But the time that I was stepping out of my home, I felt inequality and discrimination in my country, in my society, in the community where I was living. I wanted to bring change. Whenever I was coming out of my home, I could feel my neighbor. The, the women was screaming, was crying, and the man was beating the women because of honor, because of women was not allowed to go out, women. A lot of discrimination and inequality in the country. And women were suffering from violence, uh, uh, domestic violence. I wanted to help those women. I wanted to bring unity. I wanted to find a connection to bring those women together that I could help. And I had that magic ball because playing football with my brothers taught me to be united. The unity that I had together with my brothers, I wanted to bring it in the society, in the community, in the country. I took that ball, I always call it as a magic ball. Those who played football, they know that magic ball, the football, the love, the unity that brings, the power that it has. I started rolling the ball in the community in 2003. I started uh, recruiting women from schools, from local schools, to different um, communities that women were living. The idea to bring the ball 
and bring women together was to help women to get united, to stand for their right, to be a strong voice. I started campaign around the country and the number of the women who are playing football grew up every day. It wasn't an easy journey. I faced a lot of problems and challenges because football is known as a man's game. It's known as a male game, and in my country, people feel ashamed of their daughter or sister if they play football. Football was a great tool to stand up for gender equality, to stand for my right as a woman because it's known as a man's game. The journey wasn't easy. The, the number of women grew up, and every time I was facing challenges, uh, discrimination, street harassment, got ad attacked so many times uh, in, the, in the community. Uh, where, while I was going to school, so many times I was kicked out of school, out of classes. It was not only men, but also women who are standing against me, and they were saying, you are bringing shame for the country, for the, your society, and for your family. Stop playing football. I knew what I'm standing for. My mission was to raise my voice, to be a strong voice for women, to be this voice for voiceless women. 2007, I wanted to bring the recognition in a country level. I went to football association with my team, and I said, we are so many women playing football. We need to be um, recognized by the football association. We need to have a, t a tournament or a league where you can establish first women's national team because we need to have a women's national team because we need to make a history. We need to bring changes. We need to get more women um, involved in. 2007, to, uh, went to Football Association and asked. Football Association were laughing, and they were saying, it's man's game, get out. I knew what I'm asking. I didn't give up. I went back. This time, it was different. I said, let's make a deal. FIFA is giving funds for women's football, for those organizations that they have women's football. You take our money, we get the right to play football. <laughs> and of course, who doesn't love money? They accepted, and the first women national team was established. We made the history. First ever Afghanistan women's national team. <sighs> we got this pitch, you can see in the picture. The tennis court. We were training in the tennis court in order to play in an international game. We were happy because we got that uh, budge, the right to wear the national jersey. And we were happy because we knew what is the mission, what we are standing for. Our first international game, it was in, we played against Pakistan in a, a Pakistan league, and we won the cup. Nobody was thought of. We brought the cup, and we got the great international media attention. We got the power of media. We went back to our country. We went to the president of our country, and we said, we brought pride home for your country, for our country. Now everyone knows us. Give us a pitch where we can actually train properly and see what happens. The president of the country he, didn't, he couldn't say no to us because the media was there and he didn't want to have a bad image. He said, yes, we will give you the pitch. You are going to play in a, a military compound where it's the target of terrorists and every second day there is a bomb explosion. And they give us that pitch. We said, it's okay. We got that. Good deal. It's okay. <laughs> we'll go. And we got the right to play in that pitch. Every time that we were training, we had to stop. During the tra training, we had to stop because the helicopters were coming, the military helicopters, they were landing. But we didn't give up because we know 
we knew that our mission is bigger than that. Even the day threats, the bomb lost, didn't stop us because, you know, we had the unity from playing, bringing the magic ball and to unity that we had as a team together. We were standing for women's rights through football. That magic ball that brought us together. Playing in the national team, making the history was not enough for me. I wanted to do different. I wanted to bring change. And the main change was, my goal was to bring change in decision-making place. And that was the football federation of my country. They never had women employee in their, in their history. I had to fight for that position. And I won that. You can see my picture amongst all those handsome men standing, one girl alone. It was an easy journey. It was really tough. It was the, the, the amount of hate, insults, the attacks I was facing was terrifying. But I knew my goal is bigger than this. I knew that I am becoming more, more successful, and that's why they hate me. I started using media as a second tool to empower and to send message to those women who are sitting there in their home and watching me. I wanted to be an example for them, to encourage them to stand for their right, to raise their voice, to come together, to be united. When my voice was getting bigger and bigger, the number of players were more and more joining us. It was a great movement. It was a revolution. When I started, it was only me and a few of my teammates and classmates. When I finished, today, more than 5,000 women are playing in Afghanistan. When I started working in the Football Association of Afghanistan, there was no women in the, in the, in the history. But the opportunities was made, and today more than five, six women are working in Football Association. The number is growing. But there was a moment, there was a time that I had to stop because the amount of hatred and dangers that I faced, I had to leave in order to survive, in order to save my voice because I was taking my movement in a very bigger level. The amount of hatred that I faced, I had to leave in order to save my voice. I didn't give up. I wanted to save my voice. I left my country, but I never forgot my dream. And the dream was to be the voice for voiceless women. Today, I am the program director for Afghanistan Women's National Team. I have my own organization by the name of Girl Power Organization that empowers refugees around Europe and also helps the uh, different organizations that they are helping refugees. I have started my journey with great um, academy, Right to Dream Academy. Yes, and that's a brief story of my life. And I'm giving the time to my great... Thank you, Thank you so much, Khalida. Amazing. So my brain is exploding. I don't know about all of you, but I had the pleasure of sitting outside and getting to know these two women, and they're just absolutely and fascinating. But I'm going to ask you a ton of questions later, but for now, I think, let's hear Fatuma, who, by the way, just a few days ago, won the FIFA Diversity Award. So I think that deserves an applause. And on top of that, she then won the World Economic Forum Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award as well. So yeah. tell us your story, Fatima. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, it's so hard coming after a sister who literally leads the team. Mine is just a dream in the pipeline. I'm now 40 years old, and I hope to play for the national team one day. <laughs> uh, I come from northern Kenya, a region where I literally is cut off from the rest of Kenya. And we were literally marginalized. And there is a provision in the Constitution, Kenyan Constitution, which gave orders, shoot to kill. Anytime I'm, the way I'm dressed, I, 
sorry to say so, and uh, you have Afghanistan and you have Northern Kenya, you literally have two terrorists on the stage who don't carry bombs, we just carry balls. <laughs> so for me, the description is, I'm always asked, uh, when did you come from Somalia? And I say, no, I'm not Somali. Oh, then you must be Ethiopian. So I am never Kenyan first. So I have this crisis with my identity, and uh, I speak no Somali, but I feel it's okay, they call me Somali, then I'm Somali. The day they decide to call me Ethiopian, it's okay, I will be Ethiopian. And just recently somebody said, then you must be Rwandese. If you're not Ethiopian, you're not Somali, so I'm never Kenyan. Uh, coming from the north, uh, most of the girls in my class were married when they were 12 or 13 years old. And for everyone else, like marriage was the thing. So you start preparing for marriage from when you're nine years old. I had a dad who was a teacher. My mom never went to school. And for her, she literally lived her dreams through me. And she made sure I stayed in school. It wasn't easy. Along the way, my dad lost his job. And uh, I knew I was not going to high school. And my mom said to me, like, you know what? If you don't make it to high school because we don't have the money, I'm going to take you to a tailoring school. And I was like, OK. I will make some clothes, do the tailoring, and one day go to high school. I finished uh, my class eight uh, when I was like 13, 14 years old, and then my dad got back his job, <laughs> and then I went to high school. And everybody said, oh, you won't pass your exam, so university is not even on the radar. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go to university, and I'm going to study law. And everybody said, not for a nomad girl from northern Kenya. <laughs> Finished uh, high school, passed, and I made it to the university. Again, I was the first one to study law from the entire region, which is more than half of Kenya. The county I come from is called Marsabit. It's twice the size of Belgium, just for you to imagine how big it is. And there, you know, there are no schools, there are no hospitals, there are no ro roads. Literally, you have to ride on top of a truck with goats and sheep and cows to even have access to education. But as, when I was like six years old, my dad would literally hold my hand and walk with me for two kilometers to go and watch football. I have watched every World Cup since I was born in 1978. <laughs> I have watched all the Euro Cup, all the African Cup of Nations, and, but I'm not allowed to play any sport. And after finishing law school, I went back home and I was, I'm doing legal aid in the village. Uh, again, there is no access to legal services, especially for the women and children. And I felt, I thought this will be the bridge. This will be the thing. But no, because you will be defiled, you will be raped. Your case will be decided under the tree. You're not even present when the decision is being made. Most of the women and the, and the girls, they are still children. They had no voice. They had no space. And the question for me was then, how do I jump under the tree where this elders are sitting and making decisions without carrying a banner. I started out as an activist, and uh, for the initial like three years of my life, I will be on the street and literally protesting. But you can't protest against everybody. So I'm fighting the government, <laughs> fighting the elders, and literally you have the culture, you have the Sharia, you have the Kenyan constitution and the laws. Everything worked against me. But I chose not to be a victim. I chose to be a resource, and I felt I can turn this around, but slowly it might be take longer. Arrested a few times, five times I was arrested. <laughs> <laughs> and three times, literally a gun was put to my head, and I had to make a decision on how to engage differently. Dropped my activism, and I took up football. So at the age of 25 is when I literally picked up a ball made out of trash. I could not even afford a real ball, the magic ball Khalida had. <laughs> and I went to the pitch and I said, we can do things differently because every day in my village, you'll always hear the gunshots. And if it is silent, then I'm not safe. I don't feel safe. And we started shoot to score, not to kill, literally taking away the AK-47 and replacing it with the ball. And my conversation with the young people in the village then was, all they know is to solve issues through violence, but how can we turn this into something positive and take away the violence and literally disarm the mind and physically put the AK-47 down? It worked out. It was OK with the boys, but I, I was still standing on the sideline. I wasn't allowed to play. In 2008, uh, I literally went to the homes of these girls and asked them to come and join the team. I had 12 of girls. And I was super excited. We got a chance to travel to the city, Nairobi, the capital city of Kenya. 
and participated in a tournament. We didn't win. And I remember the first game, eight goals were scored against us, but I was still celebrating. My reason is, at least we were allowed to play. <laughs> so it didn't matter, you know, the goals. We went back home, not with the trophy, but at least just a chance to, to play the game. And it was Friday that we got back. By Saturday, Sunday, I have lost eight of the girls that were kidnapped for marriage. And for the next four years, I literally blamed myself for exposing them because the men will come to where we are, at, at the place where we are training and say, oh, she's so strong. Did you see her running? She will make a good wife. You take her. <laughs> and these girls were barely like 13 years old, the oldest I had. I tried getting them back to school. It wasn't possible because they were married and they're having babies and... 2012, I had the courage to go back again to the same pitch, carrying now a real ball, <laughs> and it, but I engaged differently. I went to the imam of the mosque, uh, the main mosque. We had issues with a smaller mosque, literally, which had uh, someone in the mosque, uh, you know, cursing us and saying, if you travel, don't come back safely. And, and with this imam of the main mosque, I said, can you help me design the uniforms? Is it okay if we have a hijab on the head? And you know, a jazz which is long sleeved and the shirt that goes below the knee and tights inside. And he looked at me like, no, 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 no. No football for girls. Because the minute they kick the ball, they will break their virginity. You are seen as a loose woman. There will be no man to marry you. And already, nobody will marry you. <laughs> so don't you know, literally bring the other girls into this loose life and make them prostitutes. All I ever wanted was just for them to have a chance to play the football. <clears throat> I brought samples and he looked at them. We had like three of them and he said, don't take red because it's blood. Don't do black because it's too dark. You can do green and gold, it's okay. And that is how we got our first uniform. Fast forward <laughs> today. Uh, so we, we went into the schools and engaged 13 schools. Today we have 1,645 girls playing football in Marsabek. And I believe it starts with this small step and someone has to take the first risk. And I had to be this person who was stoned, this person who was cast, for it to happen. In 2010, uh, an organization from Rwanda reached out to me and they wanted to just come and experience what we are doing with the girls and, and the football. And this led me to Street Football World where now I sit on the board. And just one year into the, into the network, this is a network that brings together 100 and now 130 organizations from around the world. But I looked at it, I felt I'm still standing on the sidelines. I want to be involved, I want to sit at the table because I have something to contribute, I have something to share. And 2012 uh, in Lyon, uh, France, I ran for the, you know, there is an election and I'm carrying a six months old baby, changing the diapers in between the me <laughs> meetings and breastfeeding and running back uh, into the sessions, and I didn't win the elections. But this was the beginning of my journey into the global stage for me. But this tiny Muslim woman who plays football now, why did I have to choose between being a mother and everybody's like, just stop it, just you know, go back to the factory of producing babies and forget about everything else. 2014, second baby, and the meetings are happening in Brazil, and I could not get a passport for my kid. Because the same morning when we had an interview with the immigration, Al-Shabaab attacked um, a bus, and they literally like, killed 140-something people, 47 if I'm not wrong. And all of a sudden, my three-month-old daughter, who was born in the city, is the face of the terrorist. I could not be given travel documents. And this officer said to me, you are Al-Shabaab, she's Al-Shabaab, we're not giving you the Kenyan documents. Go to Somalia and look for one. And I looked at him, and for once I felt like blowing somebody up, because I got angry. And I'm like, I won't say anything to you. And I looked at the, um, <laughs> my husband and I said, you know what? You have to take care of this baby for the next 10 days because I have to go to Brazil. And off to Brazil I went and uh, got elected. <laughs> and literally, like, why, again, why do I have to choose, you know, between carrying my baby and sitting in this position, which is, you know, 
procedures, not just for me, but for other girls like me, who always, like, there will be a ceiling, there will be a barrier that is put uh, into your dreams. Today I'm standing here, it's 15 years down the line, but I still feel alone. I still feel it's a lonely journey because nobody cares. People will cheer you, good job, and then that is the end of the story. The struggle for me is nobody cares in the sense that I'm literally on the front line. I face, I face Al Shabaab every day. It's an everyday threat. And then on the other side, the people who are supposed to protect me suspect me also. So you're like in between, you're not here, you're not there. And then if you look at the football industry, um, literally, is there is no space for women. If you look at the Women World Cup, still I feel lost because even the national team, the Kenyan national team, does not have a single girl or a single boy from northern Kenya, and we are more than half of the, you know, the country. So my journey now, after 15 years, I feel like, part of me feels like, hang your boots and forget about this crazy dream. Go back to your legal practice and drive a cool Mercedes Benz, <laughs> like everybody else. But I know the people in this room today are here now because this is a dream we share, and together then we can pull this uh, off. So I will end on that note, and maybe we can have a conversation. And we have a lot of similar similarities and differences, definitely. But uh, that is my story. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. Amazing. So I just kind of wanted to ask you a few questions because I'm sure the audience has a lot too. But you, you both started a lot, you talked a lot about the barriers in women's football and getting into the sport. But what was one of the few things from your start that allowed you to even begin this path? You talked about both of you had family influence. How important was that? I think for me when I started and the, the breakthrough, that, that moment, um, was I felt that the power, the power of football that could actually bring a lot of impact and change um, in society, that was the moment I used that and it was very important for me as a, as a woman and it helped me and helped so many women. And you both talk also about your fathers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which I think is quite I think different. Yeah. Yeah, for me, as, uh, you know, he led me to football, my dad, but then when I wanted to play, it was a no-no. Mm. Do everything else but not play football. And, and, and I said, but dad, every time I wanted to do something, you're one person who said to me, you can do anything and everything you want to do. So when did football become the one thing that I cannot do? Mm. So today people look at me like, oh, she's a crazy Muslim woman. <laughs> who plays football. Mm. And I'm like what, is, like, what is so bad about playing football? And at times it's good to have the family support and the fighting helps also because then you literally define your model, define yourself in that space mm. before you have the courage to step out and face the world. Mm. And if you're talking about now to the crowd, so you mentioned the so what. So you've had these amazing stories, amazing experiences. You've both fought so hard. You've both started foundations. But now what? What can everybody do or what's the next step? I think our stories are, are like a piece of a story to many thousand, thousand stories that women are facing in football industry. Um, there are women who are s struggling, of course not the same struggles that I faced in my country, but still women's football is seen as like, I mean, really it's, it's treated so poorly and it's important that FIFA takes stand confederations, uh, football clubs, it's people need to take it serious. And, and we can't do it alone. Women cannot do it alone. We need both men and women who can encourage and support each other. Because if we don't put or invest our time and our money, the women's football is, will always be a failure. Because what the world see women's football right now is like, Okay, we give you some sort of money, you have the fund, do it yourself, and then we need the results. And of course, if you live it like this, with that budget you give, at the end there was no result. Women's football will be always a filler. Mm -hmm. It will always be a, a, a just zero. It so it's won't about be. the investment, but also the support, yeah. so belief, and the, and the investment mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Great. I think that might be all the time that we actually have, very unfortunately, but um, so I'll hand it back to you. Well, listen, I think that the discussion will continue anyway amongst the people who are here, Rebecca. Um, and Kali, the what incredible passion you have when you speak, and equally for Tuma as well. It's, it's such a, a, a real pleasure to have you on stage with us. As you say, it's about support and it's about using the profile when you get the moment to really drive that message home. Um, and I think you've done that so very well today, equally for Tuma and Rebecca. Thank you very much indeed for moderating. Un fuerte aplauso, por favor, para Rebecca, Fatuma y Calida. Thank you very much indeed, ladies. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. De nada. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you.